Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest, my guest today is Dave Gardner. He hosts two fascinating podcasts about sustainability, the Overpopulation Podcast about solving world overpopulation, and the Growth Busters Podcast about sustainable living and finding the cure for growth addiction. World Population Balance, the nonprofit Dave heads, is launching the One Planet, One Child billboard campaign to demonstrate how we can solve the human overpopulation emergency humanely, voluntarily, and beautifully. So first off, thank you for your work in the world, and second, thank you for being on the program. Well, I'm glad to be here, and I've been following your work for a long time, so thank you so much for what you do. Oh, well, thank you for saying that. Um, so the first question is, uh, what is overshoot? Well, that's a great question because that's really on my mind. That is probably one of the most important things for people around the world to understand. And and I think so many people don't even realize we're in overshoot. Uh, So what is it? Well, my definition would be that the, the scale of human activity on the planet is demanding more from the earth than she can sustainably provide year after year. Uh, And I base, you know, I'm not a scientist. I'm a communicator. I kind of, joke sometimes that I try to run the ad agency for planet Earth. I'm really trying to look out for it. But I turn to the scientists, and I think the best scientific inquiry into the carrying capacity these days is done by the Global Footprint Network, and they estimate that we are close to demanding twice the renewable resources each year that the planet can actually renew in a year. Uh, So that that is overshoot. And of course, there's a lot of empirical evidence before our eyes and scientific report after scientific report giving us uh, lots of, uh, of big clues, things like uh, uh, desertification, deforestation, climate disruption, species extinction. Uh, those are just a few off the top of my head. And so overshoot is not something that is... Uh, I mean, it's, it's a larger category, not just apply applicable to humans. I mean, if you put, if you had a bunch of deer on an island, you could, the island could support a certain, certain number and they could overshoot and then what, and then, and then it would harm the, the island. Is that how overshoot generally works? Yeah, exactly. And not only harm the island, but actually harm the, the deer population as well. Cause eventually the deer population would, uh, you know, some of them would start to starve if they uh, outgrew their island, and and so there would be some some dire consequences. Nature has a way of uh, kind of correct correcting course, and I guess all species do that. And I think most of them, as I understand it, kind of you know ebb and flow in cycles. They do tend to get a little carried away if allowed to, and then. Uh, Mother Nature steps in and predators or or disease uh, or famine, you know, or hunger will uh, correct the population. I think it's more complicated for the human race because we're darn, you know, and in some ways it's great that we're so smart and in some ways maybe unfortunate that we're so smart that we figure out ways to uh, kind of artificially push the boundaries for a time. Um, and so that makes it makes it really Derek, impossible for for us to uh, come up with one right answer. If somebody says, "Well, okay, what is the carrying capacity of the of planet Earth? How many people can it support?" Because it really depends on how we're behaving. You know, if we're you know driving Hummers and flying private jets and have McMansions in four different uh, cities and have a private yachts, then the carrying capacity of the planet you know, might just be, you know, maybe 50 million or 100 million people. But if we're all, if we were all to say we'll live extraordinarily simple lives, uh, the life of a, you know, of a monk or something like that, then it could be that the carrying capacity of the planet might be, I don't know, might be 12 billion human beings. But the, the scientists that I respect that I think have done the most serious inquiry into that, how many human beings can the planet support have estimated that uh, if we were all content to live, they said they say a modest European lifestyle, which doesn't sound too bad, sounds fun. That probably means a glass of wine every now and then. Um, that uh, the planet can probably sustainably support somewhere around two billion people. And I don't worry too much about how uh, precise we are at that. I just know 
you know, whether it's 1 billion or 2 billion or 3 billion, it's a lot less than today's nearly 7.8 billion. So I know which direction we need to head if we want to work on the, the population part of that equation. Of course, there's really two parts of the equation, uh, that determine our impact on the planet. One is how many of us there are, and then the other is how we're behaving, whether we're all eating beef, whether we're all, uh, driving and flying, you know, whether we're living in big houses or small houses and air conditioning them or not, things like that. So I'm going to go a slightly different direction for a second. And I don't, I'm going to ask your personal story on this because I decided I didn't want children probably when I was about seven or eight um, in great measure because I thought there were already too many humans on the planet. My gosh, <laughs> that was very early in life. Well, I didn't actually get a vasectomy until I was maybe <laughs> 42 or 43. So I made a decision, but it was like, you know, I, I didn't, uh, um, I didn't, I didn't absolutely commit, you know, it, it, I, it, it could have possibly gone another direction. It wasn't like at seven years old, I decided my fate forever. Yeah, it was probably good that you kept your options open for a little while beyond seven. Exactly, I'm a Sagittarius, so I have to keep my options open. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm wondering how you, how this. My point is that this issue was important to me for seven. Whether I chose not to have children or not is, is is not the point so much as at seven and eight I was aware. Well, I'm going to go ahead and tell a story real quick. Sorry to take up from your interview that when I was about seven. Um, in second grade, a subdivision went in right next door to where I live, and all the grasshoppers disappeared, all the meadow disappeared, the cottonwood trees, the, the meadow larks, and they all got replaced by houses. And I remember thinking, when I was seven years old, this can't go on forever. If they keep doing this, if they keep taking the homes away from the meadow larks, the meadow larks won't have any place to live. And so basically, when I was seven, I didn't have the language, but I understood that you can't have infant growth on the planet. Wow. Okay. You were ahead. You At that point, let me interrupt. Sorry. You were ahead of, you know, nearly every member of uh, Congress <laughs> today in your understanding of physics at age seven. I'm impressed. Um, so, so thank you for saying that. Um, so, so. I'm wondering about your story on coming to understand. Because it just it seems so obvious that there are, you know, and you just chat with people and everybody has stories of, oh man, I can't go back to where I grew up because where I grew up there was this oak tree behind and now it's been cut down and there was this beautiful pond and now that's all been taken over. Everybody has stories like that. So I'm wondering, how did you come to, to care about population? They grow both because those are obviously intertwined. I'll try not to make it too long a story, um, but because it's kind of a two part story is one is I, uh, you know, an impression was made on me when I was, uh, you know, a teenager. I developed a good, strong conservation ethic from uh, I was lucky enough to attend some really neat camps uh, that were a part of the school public school curriculum at the time. And so got uh, some good doses of uh, of conservation ethic there. And. Uh, I don't remember who, but somebody handed me Desert Solitaire by Edward Abbey. Uh, so I read that when I was in high school, and that is a great book, and that had a real foundational impact on my way of thinking. Uh, and I know that I was aware of The Population Bomb by Paul and Ann Ehrlich when that was was published in 1968, and, and the, the first Earth Day 50 years ago in 1970 uh, a lot of that uh, had an impact on me, but you know, I was I wasn't quite in high school in 1970, in the first Earth Day, so I wasn't paying that much attention. And in fact, I went on to you know graduate from high school, go to college, ended up uh, uh, becoming a filmmaker. And uh, although I worked for on a PBS series for a few years, I decided I wanted a little bit more sleep and a little bit more money. And, uh, went to the dark side and ended up working for Fortune 500 companies producing propaganda films for them for over, over 20 years and trying to be a good provider. I got married. I had two kids, stopped after two, got a vasectomy immediately because the population bomb had 
made an impression on me. So I thought I felt like I was doing my part when I stopped at two. Uh, and that decision would have been about 1990. Um, but I was, you know, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't uh, in, activated around climate change. I wasn't doing anything to uh, help pr- protect and preserve this planet that I really, truly loved. I'd really developed this great love for nature. I loved camping and hiking and and all that. But I, you know, I, I think I did what almost every Earth Day demonstrator did, uh, got caught up and got onto the treadmill of, uh, you know, getting married and trying to be a good provider and trying to survive. And uh, and it's easy to run out and not have time to to do the, do all the right things. So it wasn't until, oh gosh, uh, 1993 that I uh, started getting my path realigned. I, I made a move back to my hometown from a huge city. I'd been in Dallas, Texas for 20 years, and there's n- no nature. <laughs> all there is in Dallas is money. <laughs> Money and cars, as far as the eye can see. Um, but that kept me there for a long time because there were all these big corporate headquarters that uh, uh, helped me pay the pay, pay the bills. Those were my clients. Um, but I finally just got sick of it and had enough and moved back to Colorado Springs in 93. Uh, and it was a lifestyle move. Uh, I wanted to raise my children in a quieter, safer community. I wanted to not, you know, I didn't want it to take me an hour to get from one side of town to the other, things like that. Um, but I watched during the nineties, I watched that quality of life go downhill as the city of Colorado Springs was hell bent for leather to grow. That was their metric for success. How fast is our population growing? And I, and that just sickened me. It was kind of like if you bought a, you know, and I hate to use these materialistic metaphors, but I think most people will get it. Let's say you bought a Corvette and but every day when you walked out into the garage to get in your Corvette, it was a little bit more like a Ford F one fifty pickup. You know, and after ten or fifteen years it was a pickup truck instead of a Corvette. And I, I saw that happening and I and I hated it and I figured there wasn't anything we could do about it until around two thousand, two thousand one uh, the American West really entered a, you know, a, a big tr- period of drought. Uh, drought was really making headlines. And I thought to myself, you know what? Water, that's something we can't really change. Uh, that might be the thing. Of course, I, little did I know we would try, you know, we could build dams and pipelines uh, like crazy. But I figured maybe a uh, limited water supply might actually cause uh, rational thought in the American West and in my hometown of Colorado Springs. Uh, so I then started kind of it, uh, actively uh, trying to get involved in local politics and point out some of the ways that the t- city was subsidizing growth because we, uh, uh, the city fathers all thought that that was, you know, the source of all prosperity and tried to get you know, other citizens uh, excited about this so that we could have a, a, a louder voice and uh i really wasn't making very much progress but uh but ultimately uh following 911 when my uh all the work i was doing for the dark side all my corporate clients uh they stopped spending money after 911 uh there was a, per- a year, period of about a year where they just were afraid to spend money and so suddenly i was having to pick up the phone and dial for dollars and, and, and look for work. And I decided, heck, if I'm going to have to look for work, I want the work to be something that I want to do, a story that I want to tell. And that was when I decided to, I'm going to produce a documentary about population growth and our, uh, you know, our society's celebration of it instead of uh, our society trying to, uh, get unhooked from it. And, uh, during that journey, it took me several years because I was raising money while I was researching and producing the film. Uh, it took me a, a little while to discover that it was, that our problem wasn't just population growth, but it was uh, worship of economic growth. Uh, that I came to that uh, reckoning a little later on. So uh, by the time I finished that documentary, Growth Busters Hooked on Growth, it really was a film that I think was about 50% about our uh, irrational behavior around population growth and 50% of around our suicide mission of pursuit of economic growth. And so can you talk for a moment about 
uh, exponential growth. Just sort of give give a quick primer for for those who who may not uh, know what it is. Okay. Uh, and you know, I just want to note. I, I suppose your regular listeners know this: that you're, you know, being an, an excellent host and asking questions, you know, asking good questions, so that I can share what I know. But of course, you know all the answers to these questions. Um, so, but that's what uh, what a good interviewer does. They're not worried about uh, whether their audience thinks they know the answers or not. Uh, so, exponential growth um, is really one of the. It's the reason why when you look at uh, the global human population and the history of it, uh, the graph is like a hockey stick laying down on, on you know, on the long side. Uh, it, it's uh, fairly flat for millions and millions and millions of years. And then only, you know, a couple hundred years ago did it start to turn up and did uh, human population really start to grow. But when it started to really grow, it just kicked into high gear and that was enabled by, uh, uh, you know, agriculture and then, uh, fossil fuels and the industrial age, uh, and medical advances. All these things kind of came to be the perfect storm that made it so that we could just, you know, it was like an infestation of, uh, of human beings, like a, like a plague of locusts, only it was a plague of human beings. And so we went from fewer than, uh, a billion people on the planet, uh, in 1900 to, uh, you know, less than 200 years later, uh, you know, we're already up getting close to 8 billion people. So, uh, that is, that is exponential growth. And it happens because the number, the number in the population really does depend on uh, the generation before, you know, the size of each generation is going to have an impact on the, the size of the su- successive generation. Cause you got, you know, your mom and dad get married. They have four kids. You know, I'm talking about in ancient history because hopefully we're not doing that anymore. Uh, but let's say back in 1960, they would have four kids. If each of those four kids got married and had four kids, you know, look at the number of grandchildren there are. And then if each of those grandchildren got married and had four kids, you know, the, the family tree just blossoms. That is exponential growth. That's the kind of thing that happens with a, with a virus too. Uh, so it's, uh, it's multiplication. It's really leveraged. And, uh, one example that I think most people don't think about because very few people question this, uh, they, they kind of understand this with population, but they question uh, the, any criticism of our pursuit of robust economic growth. But the economy is the same way. It's just like, you know, you know your savings account uh, that's earning interest, not very much interest these days. But, uh, the interest depends on the principal amount in your savings account. And a year, a year after you open that account, you start getting interest on the principal plus the interest that you earned. So it builds on, on itself, uh, in an exponential fashion. And, uh, a lot of people, when they're explaining exponential growth, they like to use doubling time to explain how, uh, how long it takes for, for something to double. Uh, cause if it's growing at a steady rate, if it's a population of bacteria or human beings or deer or it's money in your savings account, if it's growing, say, uh, 3% per year, then to com- compute the doubling time, you would divide 72, uh, by 3 and you get, what, about 20, 24, something like that. Uh, so it's about, the doubling time is about 24 years. So, you start with uh, an economy of, let's say, that's just represented by one. 24 years later, the economy is two times that size. 24 years after that, it's not three times that size. No, it's four times that size because it's doubled again. And then just 24 years later, it's doubled again. So it's eight time that's, times that size. And none of us are going to be alive for 720 years, but... At just 3% annual growth rate for our economy, which is what everybody, you know, you find, it's hard to find very many people around the world and especially policymakers who wouldn't cheer 
for 3% or better annual economic growth. But in 720 years, we would have an economy 1 billion times the size of today's economy. And I don't think anybody would, if they stopped and thought about it, would say, would, would believe that that's possible because the, the economy is, you know, that's the, all of these, you know, it's money changing hands, but money changes hands when uh, something is pulled out of the ground, when it's mined and converted into a product and, and sold, or when energy is, is burned, uh, you know, taking a, a flight or performing a service, uh, running computer servers, uh, you know, their economic activity has a price that it extracts from the planet. And we've been working, you know, some of us have been working hard to try to make it more efficient so that it's not as hard on our life supporting ecosystems as, as it used to be. But uh, there's a limit to how, how efficient we can be with that. And, and, uh, you know, we've kind of reached that limit. So now if we decide that we're going to continue this pursuit of robust economic growth, uh, we're basically that, that's the suicide mission. We're going to kill the planet. But when you were talking a little bit earlier about, um, you, you mentioned suicide mission earlier, and you also said that our discourse around population is, I believe the phrase you used was not rational, but it was something like that. Yeah. Can you talk about? Can you can you can you show that? To, I mean, it seems pretty obvious to me, but can you show that to audience members that it's not? I mean, it's, honestly, the fact that you and I are even having to discuss this seems crazy to me. Yeah. <laughs> obvious that you can't have infinite growth on a finite planet. And I, I, can, can you talk about your understanding of the perhaps reasons for the non rationality of the discussion or? Or the, the, I mean, it clearly is a suicide mission. I'm sorry, I'm going to go on again. I just got interviewed a couple of days ago by uh, a couple of people who were um, talking about how we can how we can change society going into the future. And I was talking about exactly what you're saying that this culture is killing the planet. So our stolen scientists are saying the oceans could be devoid of fish by 2050, and they were just they were saying, but Derek. People don't want to give up their televisions or whatever it is. And I was like, so the argument for killing the planet is I want my MTV? Um, and, it, it's the, yeah. and I kept saying, look, don't get mad at me. I'm simply saying what is and isn't possible. And they're saying, but we want this. And I'm like, but it doesn't matter what you want. I'm telling you what's possible. And I'm just rambling. So, so please take this any smart direction, any direction smarter than my question. Oh, that's a great question, a great, uh, great launching pad. And, um, you know, I mean, I mean, part of it, you know, part of the answer is something that I think you, you I don't know, maybe you have some theories about it, but I keep looking for someone out there who has the, you know, the silver bullet who comes, comes to us and says, I, I can tell you exactly why the human race is in such utter denial of limits and won't do anything to, to rein ourselves in. Uh, cause I don't have a really good answer to that, but I have a kind of an interesting process that I went through to lead me to, uh, to be outspoken about the population side of the issue. And that's harder, a little bit harder to be outspoken about these days because it's a subject that's been, it's been brushed under the rug for decades. It's, it's kind of poisonous. Uh, people have, such a misunderstanding. There have been a few bad actors and a, and a few bad attempts to do something about overpopulation that have made it easy for people to leap to all kinds of conclusions about everything that's wrong with doing anything about overpopulation. But, but let me take you through the, why do you, hate, I'm sorry. Why do you hate babies? Why yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you, hate you know, yeah. And you know, and the answer to that is, you know, I love babies. That's why I'm doing this. I'm trying to make sure that there's, a, you know, a, a shot at a decent life for, for all the children of the world. Cause we're busy just com- completely burning down the house to, to keep warm and we're leaving them, uh, you know, a shit storm. Um, but anyway, 
Uh, so we, so we know where all the scientific reports tell us that we're in overshoot. We are actually in the process of slowly crippling Earth's life supporting ecosystems. And with each passing year, they're less capable of meeting our needs than they, they were the year before. And so that's not a good, uh, position to be in. Uh, we know that there's two big multipliers that uh, have, that have influenced that. One is the, our behavior. You know, whether we're eating a plant-based diet or meat, whether we're burning fossil fuels or not, um, whether we're living in McMansions or, or living more modest lives, all those kind of things, uh, whether we're using plastic straws or not, even, you know, filters into that uh, to some small degree. Uh, and, and even recycling, although recycling makes so much, so, so little difference uh, relative to what we really need to be doing. Uh, so there's our behavior. That's one part of the equation. And then there's how many of us doing the misbehaving. So our population numbers, we've got those two things. And if we, let's say our goal is to leave a decent planet for, for the children of the world. We want them to have a habitable climate. We want them to have a roof, roofs over their heads. We want them to have jobs, food on the table, um, you know, and maybe even access to some of the beautiful nature that we were lucky enough to enjoy. So how do we how do we get back into balance? Well, we're going to have to deal with one or both of those two multipliers. So Global Footprint Network tells us that we're pretty close to two planet living right now, and we need to get back to one planet living. So we really need to cut that impact in half, just roughly. Um, so let's say we're uncomfortable talking about overpopulation because, you know, there's any number of reasons uh, that people are afraid to talk about it. They, uh, they think it's racist because, uh, some people, when they've talked about it or tried to address it, were focusing on, uh, reducing the, the births in, uh, you know, people with black skin or brown skin or people in some other country or people of some other religious persuasion, not, not them. You know, there's some people who have felt that way and, and acted that way. That doesn't mean every, everybody is, but, but that's one of the things that, poisoned the overpopulation subject. Another is that there's this uh, fairly universal feeling that uh, we have procreative freedom, that uh, no, nobody can dictate uh, what we do in the bedroom and how many children we choose to conceive. And I'm not even going to argue that point. I, I have no interest today in dictating anybody's family size decision. I just want to make sure everyone uh, is fully informed and makes uh, makes an informed and considered decision about family size. I think if they understand the implications of their family size decision uh, on the quality of life for any children that they might bring into the world, that they would make uh, the most loving decision that they could, which would be to these days, knowing what we know, the most loving thing you can do is to is to either not bring a child into the world, or if you if you simply must, to limit yourself to just bringing one child into the world. But let's say, yeah, that's just too uncomfortable. We're not going to deal with that. Let's just solve the problem over on the economic side, how our overconsumption. Let's deal with that. Well, if we do the math. Um, and this is all just kind of back of the cocktail napkin math, just to kind of get us into the ballpark. You know, if you take our close to $90 trillion economy and you divide that in half, and then you divide that by about 7.8 billion people on the planet so that you figure out what's a fair share for everyone walking the, the earth today, you end up with, um, I think you end up with about maybe $6,000 U.S per person of economic activity, uh, that would be sustainable. That would be one planet living. Uh, cause, uh, and so this is just kind of a rough proxy, but it'll get you in the ballpark. So it would be kind of like, you've got to take a pay cut. You've got to be willing to live on a $6,000 a year salary. If you want to ignore population, uh, and, Cut your consumption so that you're living, uh, sustainably, uh, for today, at today's level of population. Now, of course, if the population keeps on growing, 
uh, then you're going to have to live on an even smaller salary next year and the year after that and the year after that. And I'm thinking, you know what? That's going to be a tough case to make. In fact, I'm, I'm not even willing to live that simply. I wish I was, but, uh, but I'm not. Uh, so that tells me, you know what? We really need to work on both sides of the equation. We need to be dealing with the population numbers and with our level of consumption so that it's not such a, you know, such a dramatic, uh, and unpleasant adjustment to try to get into sustainable balance. So that's kind of the, the, the math that I did. And, uh, and that tells me we've got to get over our fears, uh, about talking about overpopulation and we've got to, uh, we've, so my mission, uh, in doing the overpopulation podcast, which I produce and host for World Population Balance, which is a great nonprofit whose mission is just to alert and educate people to, to improve overpopulation literacy. Um, so that's one, that's one of my main missions because there are too few organizations and too few people out there championing that, uh, that information, uh, just because it has been so poisonous. There, there are a lot more uh, nonprofits and environmental organizations and environmentalists who are work, they say they're working on the overconsumption side of the, uh, equation. But of course the truth is the few of them are really being honest with you about or with themselves about the level of, uh, degrowth that would be necessary uh, in order to get into true sustainable balance if they're going to ignore our numbers, especially. So, uh, I might be shortchanging things here a little bit. So, so that's kind of a big part of the work I'm doing is I'm saying we need, you know, I'm, I'm never going to suggest that we should only work on our numbers and ignore our profligate overconsumption. We definitely need to be working on that. You know, we need to be, uh, giving up fossil fuels and we need to get over our love affair with, uh, American automobile and, and gosh, there's just so many things that, you know, don't really Add to the, our happiness in life, but really are killing the planet. But, uh, but we, at the same time, we will never get where we need to go if we're not willing to make sure that everybody understands that the number of us on the planet makes a huge difference. And the days of, uh, you know, having three or four or eight kids are, are behind us. It's really not in the best interest of the next generation to do that. And the good news is, We've actually, that's, we've really been working on solving that problem just voluntarily over the past 50 years. We've cut the, you know, the average number of kids around the planet in half without, uh, having to commit murder, without having to make it illegal to have a second or third kid, without taxing people to, uh, to extremes for their third or fourth kid. Uh, people just naturally have been choosing to have smaller families. So, uh, meanwhile, what have they been doing on the overconsumption side? Well, <laughs> pretty much, uh, it would be a very tiny percentage of the population that's doing anything to, to skinny up their lives, unfortunately. Uh, so that tells me that the low hanging fruit, uh, the easier solution to get into play is to really just, to, uh, advance, you know, increase our progress on moving to a small family norm, average, uh, fertility rate, average, for the globe is about 2.45 today. And, uh, you know, we need to get that down below two. We need to get it down close to one. We need to make one child families the norm. So even in a place like the United States, where we're at about 1.75, I think today, when, and a lot of people think that's mission accomplished. That's below replacement rate. It's not good enough in a country full of, you know, profligate over consumers. So, uh, so we need to make faster progress and continue the progress if we want to have a planet that's left. Uh, so I'm, uh, I am advocating really strongly for making sure everybody just understands that, that they know we're an overshoot, that they know overpopulation has to be part of the solution. It's not the only part, but if you want to leave that out, you will not succeed. So I remember reading about, about, Half of the children who are born on the planet right now are not, were not actively planned. Yeah. This 
this suggests one fairly easy step we can take. And can you also talk about um, on your website, um, you have some solutions to uh, humanely solving overpopulation that um, what are what are some means that have been what have stu- what have studies shown that have lowered birth rates? Okay, uh, well you're, you're right that uh, that it is close to half of the births are, are unplanned. That doesn't mean that they wouldn't happen in a planned way, you know, later on. Uh, but but that does represent a huge uh, opportunity for us if we if we just uh, the way to solve that part of the problem is to one uh, improve access to family planning to contra to contraception uh, make it uh, easily easy convenient accessible maybe even free it would it would be worth it to make it free um, but also uh, that doesn't completely solve that problem because there are some still some societies that uh, have a lot of uh, just some cultural baggage where they're, you know, where the men, for the men, it's a, uh, a sign of, sign of their manhood. It's kind of like in, in the U.S., how big is your pickup truck? Well, in some parts of the world, it's how many children have you, have you sired? Uh, and so that, you know, we've got to get over that. So just making contraception available isn't going to solve that. Uh, but there are efforts to, uh, to, to kind of get those cultures, uh, moving in the right direction. Um, and let's see. The other thing is we do know, of course, that when women uh, are educated and they have opportunities to have meaningful lives beyond motherhood, that they tend to choose to have smaller families. So uh, so educating women and uh, gender equity around the world, those are things that uh, can those are some of the easy ways and, and they're you know, they're really valuable and noble causes in and of themselves. I mean, you know, women should have opportunity. Women should be educated. They should have an equal say in every, you know, every family decision, whether you're trying to solve world overpopulation or not. It just so happens that that also helps to bring down the, uh, the typical family size. Some people, because they are afraid to uh, talk about overpopulation. They like to just leave that brushed under the rug. They think that they can, uh, you know, they, they tell, they sort of tell us, you know, don't worry about it. Don't talk about it. Uh, because we know what the solution is. We can tap dance around it. We can pretend that we can pretend that we're not doing anything about overpopulation. We can just pretend like we're just trying to educate and empower women. Um, I just don't happen to think that that is uh, that's going to get us there because I know plenty of educated, empowered women who have eight kids. You know, uh, how many kids did Queen Victoria had? What eleven kids or something like that? Um, you know, we 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 owe it to the women of the world to not hide the full information about the imp- implications of their family size choices. So, uh, so I choose to just boldly. Talk about this poison subject, and the more we talk about it, the less of a third rail it will be. Because I think everybody needs to understand what what's at play when they're making their family size decision. What part of your question did I not answer? Um, well, I, I no, that's that's good. But the part of the difficulty, I mean, so basically, I mean, yes, of course, educating women and teaching little girls to read all that is incredibly important. And one of the things it does is it points out the insanity of our uh, predicament because really all we have to overcome in order to get to where both you and I want to go is to uh, overtake a couple thousand years of Abrahamic patriarchal religions, <laughs> uh, capitalist growth imperative that's been tossed on top of it. Yeah. Um, so so that that's... I'm not meaning to be cynical at all. It's, it's, I'm, I'm, yes, educating the woman is so important and educating people is so important. And we still were faced with this Abrahamic, with this control, this male control of women's, of women's lives. Um, yeah. 
having said that though, I want to, I want to, having sort of dropped that bomb, I want to go a slightly different direction for a second. <laughs> you mentioned soap operas on your, on your, um, on the, on the world population balance dot org website. And can you talk about the, the importance of soap operas in fight, in, in fighting the, uh, in, in, in fighting the problems that we face? Well, I think that's, that's one of the better efforts, uh, underway to, uh, influence that, uh, that culture, you know, the, the cultural inertia, inertia that, uh, that's keeping some societies really stuck in, in high fertility rates. It's just, you know, the, the norm has been refusing, almost refusing to budge. And, you know, I know better than to think that I can, uh, you know, I'm a filmmaker and a podcaster now, uh, do I think I can record a series of podcasts or make a film to show in Niger, which is the uh, the country in sub-Saharan Africa that has the highest uh, fertility rate these days, which I think is around six or almost six? Uh, do I think that I can, you know, write pamphlets or make movies or podcasts that's going to change the cultural norm in Niger? No, no way. I don't. I don't live there. I don't know the culture. I don't understand the culture. Uh, that so that culture has to kind of change from inside. And, uh, and so, uh, one of the better efforts out there at doing that is the Population Media Center, another nonprofit, uh, where they actually will go into these countries, uh, where they're, uh, where they perceive the, the greatest need and the greatest opportunity. And they work with people in that culture and help, they give them the tools and the training to turn them into Soap opera producers, radio, uh, dramas, or in some cases they're doing television or, or web series where they uh, model, uh, smaller family decisions. Uh, they find ways to, to work those, uh, issues into the, uh, the plots of their programs. And I guess in some ways it wouldn't be that different from, you know, from some of the really groundbreaking television programs that have been done in the U.S. Uh, you know, that, that didn't have necessarily, uh, a, a real overt goal of changing our culture, but I'm thinking of shows like All in the Family that made it, uh, so that we could talk about, uh, bigotry and racism and, you know, kind of brought it up, you know, out, out from under the rug, uh, and put some attention on it just by, you know, putting it into some entertainment. So I think that's kind of the approach that Population Media Center is doing ar- around the world. And, and uh, beyond that, you know, I don't know, as a guy, you know, a pretty privileged guy in the middle of the United States, I don't think I think the best I can do is make sure everybody who I can reach is really fully informed so that they're making good family size decisions and so that they will support uh, family planning aid around the world. We can't possibly give that too much support uh, and so that they will support efforts like those of Population Media Center. So we have about five minutes left and um, I have um, two sort of two questions in one. We've talked about population, obviously some, and can we talk a little bit about growth clusters and also um, oh shoot, I forgot the second half. Um, if I think of the second half, I'll ask you. Can you talk about growth clusters for a minute? Sure. And then maybe the second half was the billboard campaign for world population balance. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that. Well, so, so growth busters is the, the project that I created when I decided to make that documentary about our, uh, suicidal obsession with growth. And, uh, uh, when that, that film was released in 2011, but I continued the project because the education of the world well, wasn't complete. And in fact, in some respects, I've made so darn little progress getting the world to recognize that uh, uh, so many of our policy goals and our, so much of our behavior is just not sustainable. So I continue that project with the Growth Busters podcast and uh, public speaking and uh Things like that. I think we've got a webinar series that we did a couple of years ago, and um, by the time this episode's out, that will be uh, our little free period that we've made those 
available for free and the Growthbusters movie for free, uh, those will be over. But uh, if somebody gets on the email list at growthbusters.org, they'll, that'll be their best chance of learning when we will make those available free again. But they can certainly uh, become a supporter of the Growthbusters project and have access to the webinars and and you can buy or rent the movie. Uh, on the Billboard project for World Population Balance, we just decided it's time. It is time to bring that subject out from under the rug, make sure that uh, all the people who are – it's just amazing how many journalists and policymakers and pundits, not, not let alone the general public, first of all, are not aware of overshoot. They're not aware of overpopulation. They don't understand how in a 100 years – uh, with a one child family average, we could be back down at about three billion people in just a hundred years. It's a solvable problem. Uh, and, and so we did a crowdfunding campaign and we launched the one planet, one child billboard campaign right at the wrong time. The billboards went up just as everybody was told to stay at home and there weren't, were, weren't a bunch of commuters driving by our billboards and the news media didn't want to talk about it because it's coronavirus 24-7. Uh, but we did launch a great website called OnePlanetOneChild.org uh, and uh, that project's going to continue. We're going to continue to be looking for good advertising uh, venues so that we can demonstrate what it would take. We just need every country around the world to have a public campaign to rally the public, just like they were, just like we've been rallied to shelter at home right now in the, uh, the COVID-19 situation. We need to rally the public to say, you know what? We are not going to have an overpopulated world. It is, we're going to celebrate one child families. We're going to celebrate everybody's choice to either be child free or to, or to have fewer children. That's all it'll take. And <clears throat> I remember the, the other the other part of it, which is the thing that holds all of this together. Can you talk for just a couple minutes about um, the refusal to accept limits? Because that's for me, that feels like part of what is the the base of both the refusal to accept limits on human population and the refusal to accept limits on economic growth. And can you talk about that for just a moment and, and, and then and then end on a happy note? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it a shot. You may only be happy with half of my answer because I think one half of the answer is that there is a part of our society that, that gets richer uh, as long as we ignore the limits. Uh, you know, it is in their best short-term financial interest to uh, to keep us, uh, you know, on this suicide mission. And so there's a lot of money, you know, being spent on propaganda uh, to uh, to convince us that, uh, you know what, there, there aren't limits, that, that human ingenuity and technology will solve our problems. Look what we did. Paul Ehrlich predicted mass starvation, and we came up with the Green Revolution. We just need a, another green revolution now to, so that we can feed the next three or four billion people that we want to add to the planet. Um, so there's a lot of money going into, you know, into denial and, and of course media companies, you know, they need lots of eyeballs or ears in order to sell to advertisers. So they're not really highly motivated for us to get a handle on. Overpopulation, they would like a, a growing market. So that works against us. I think that's just part of it. Uh, the other part of it is, is some kind of psychological, you know, f feeling of being invincible, I think. And, and maybe part three would be what, you know, look at recent history. We've had a pretty darn successful 200 year, almost 300 year binge where a lot of things seemed to get a lot better as we grew. And so there's this really strong myth. In fact, I, the way I characterize it is that, that it's the biggest, strongest, most powerful religion in the world is the worship of growth of everlasting. Uh, that is huge. So, uh, so that's my answer to that question. And how in the world do I segue to a happy ending? Um, you know, why, why are we doing this? There, there, there must be a ray of hope. Otherwise, I should be out on the golf course today. I think also you're doing it 
the right thing to do, then there is a certain satisfaction that comes from telling the truth. Yeah, there's some integrity to that, living with integrity. And it's, you know, it is the most meaningful work. When I set out to make the Growth Busters documentary, I didn't realize I was kind of taking a vow of poverty. I was becoming a starving filmmaker. And my life as, uh, you know, and so I don't make very much money uh, to this day. But my life is so much better than it was when I was on the treadmill in service to the to that system, that unsustainable system. Uh, I mean, there is a lot of joy in living sustainably. I think you've said you've said a, a, a whole bunch of really great things. And I think for me at least the most important thing you said was the last thing about religion a moment ago. And can you can you end with that? Can you can you talk for just twenty seconds about the religion of how did you call it? Uh the worship worship of growth everlasting. Yeah. Can you can you talk about that for literally twenty seconds? Well, this, this religion, this worship of growth everlasting, when you think about it, it is, it is big. It is so powerful that we, you know, we've been trying to get a handle on climate change for a few decades. And the one thing that we haven't been willing to do is sacrifice economic growth in order to save ourselves. That's how powerful it is. Uh, if we can somehow find a way to throw economic growth or just throw growth off of its pedestal. Um, that is our hope. We've got to knock it off of its pedestal because it is a false God and it's really keeping us from rediscovering the true joy of living. Well, thank you so much for being a blasphemer against the worship of growth everlasting. And thank you for all your work. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Dave Gardner. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio and the Progressive Radio Network.